Quite a bit has changed for the Bureau of Indian Affairs since its inception in 1824. What started as an office to negotiate treaties between the federal government and Indian tribes has grown into a bureau that looks to help tribes become more self-sufficient. Here to tell us more about the BIA's colorful and sometimes controversial past is ASU history professor Don Fixico. He's the author of the new book, Bureau of Indian Affairs, which traces nearly 200 years of BIA history. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, why was the Bureau of Indian Affairs created? Who created it back in 1824? Surprisingly, it, it comes from the efforts of one person by the name of John C. Calhoun. And John C. Calhoun was a senator from South Carolina and very powerful at that time. But he was also powerful because much of Indian Affairs was um, within the War Department. Uh, treaties, Indian Wars, and things like that. And Indian Affairs were kind of just bounced around. And he said, well, why don't we open an Indian office? And he actually did by himself. And that was considered controversial at the time. Uh, controversial at the time because it kind of took all the authority into his hands when it kind of belonged to the authority of Congress and also the President of the United States. Was that authority abused? And if so, how quickly? Well, it, it, authority, I think, is always kind of abused and kind of you know, always at risk. But what it did was to kind of bring all of Indian affairs and Indian manners under, under one hand. And with, uh, with the federal government and thinking at, at the time of what was best for the United States as a growing country and what was best for the Indian nations too. At the time, I know the BIA was involved with creating reservations, with, with relocation, these sorts of things. And we know about the Trail of Tears and, and those particular uh, aspects of, of history. How much was the Bureau involved in these things? Well, the Bureau was involved very much, but see, much of policy making comes out of, the, um, uh, out of the halls of Congress and also from the President of the United States. And the responsibility of the Bureau of Indian Affairs is to carry out that policy. Indeed, the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Indian Commissioner, can recommend, uh, make recommendations, and often Congress, not knowing enough about uh, Indian Affairs at, at a particular time and uh, point, uh, will then follow the recommendations of the Bureau of Indian Affairs because who's in charge of Indian Affairs is supposed to know the most about Indian yes. Affairs and the latest conditions, uh, statistics, um, all of that, but sometimes that has proven often not the case throughout history. There was one, uh, the General Allotment Act of 1887, I thought was fascinating in that it basically it, it, it pushed for an individual nature among tribes and among uh, tribe members, and yet this shattered what was a communal society, correct? A traditional communal society. Oh, very much so. In fact, the Dawes Act of 1887 was perhaps one of the most damaging acts that introduced a new policy that had a powerful effect on Native people. And by individualizing Native people and making them into farmers, and certain kinds of farmers, because many were already farmers, uh, some obviously were not, they hunted buffalo, and some people fished, uh, that sent a very kind of strong cultural impact to Native people to be individuals like individual Americans and to think that way when they had always really kind of thought in a very communal way of, of helping others and, and being a, sharp, a part of a moral economy. And had a lasting influence, correct? Oh, well, very much so because individuality will become a part of American Indian cultures because there's not just one Indian culture but many Indian cultures and as they kind of incorporate that and make it a part of theirs. The interesting thing about Native people and their resilience to survive and also to, to succeed in, in the 21st century is to embrace another culture and their more inclusion rather than exclusion. I was going to say, if there's something that kind of overrides the book, it is the resilient nature of Native peoples dealing with everything from boarding schools to relocation yes. and these sorts of things. It's one challenge after another, and it never seems to end. Well, indeed, it's, uh, it, it never ends. But there's one thing about Native people, is, in addition to resilience, is their desire to be sovereign because it's, and it's not really totally a, a political sovereignty, but one of feeling free in a spirit you know, to be in control of your own lives, and that they will never yield. Let's talk about self-determination because it seemed as though when we got toward, what, 60s, 1960s, 1970s, that became a big deal, correct? Oh, that was a pivotal time. It was a pivotal time for not just Indian people, but the entire nation and the entire world. As historians, we look at pivotal moments that kind of define things and, and change the course of the entire world, and that period did. And what it also did was to allow Native people to implement their own policy. In 1961, an Indian, Indian policy was introduced by Native people themselves at a conference in Chicago, and they presented that Indian policy to President Kennedy the following year. From that point on, you had kind of two Indian policies. Mm, interesting. And, and now, correct me if I'm wrong, 
BIA has gone from this, this offshoot from the War Department to, is it 95% uh, Native people now are in the BIA? Is that true? Yes. Largely due to self-determination, the federal government's thinking was Indian preference. Let Native people run Indian affairs, and so you have um, the head position of the Bureau of Indian Affairs is actually the assistant secretary, which was a change in that position from Indian commissioner. And of the 16 people who've held that position, they have been Native people, Native men largely, and one woman, Ada Deer. So 95% of BIA employees and, and, and just the staff and personnel are now uh, American Indian, which is amazing. So let's go back. Let's, let's, sure. Last question. Let's go back. What the BIA was, what the BIA is, the differences. The BIA was really kind of a paternalistic, you know, we need to take care of Native people. Native people then begin to show the United States we can take care of ourselves, but let, it do, let us do it our own way. And self-determination spins out of that, and so you see the, bear, the Bureau of Indian Affairs is really kind of a partner uh, in relationship to, to the Indian nations. So basically, it's, it's kind of like a government-to-government -government relationship Very with the so. American government. Very much so. And that will develop? Oh, yes, because when you have this partner-to-partner -partner relationship, there are now 566 federally recognized tribes. When I wrote this book and when this came out, there was, there was 564. So the Indian nations are increasing and there are about another 70 who want a federal recognition. Real quickly, what do you want people to take from this book? To have a better understanding of Native people and the struggle that they've gone through and what they've succeeded in doing. It's fascinating read. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me.